Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone. Uh, hi there, my name is Alex Wood-Daniels. I'm the senior analyst here at IndieBio New York, and I have the pleasure of being uh, the host for the next panel topic, which is on green industrial biotech. Uh, which can be broadly defined as using the tools of biotechnology to create processes or products that are more sustainable in the spaces of food, agriculture, materials, and chemicals. So a very nebulous subject, but uh, today I really want to focus on a success story coming out of IndieBio. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce our guests. First with Ted, did you want to quickly tell everyone a little bit about yourself and Halo Mine? All right, let me see if I can do this as Steve trained me. Hi, I'm Ted Eveleth, I'm the CEO of Halo Mine. Our mission is to take the same level of chlorine you find in a pool and put it on every surface to provide long-term protection against pathogens. And we started with surfaces like hospital bed rails and high-touch surfaces, and now we're looking at medical devices like IV and urinary catheters, as well as wound dressings, among other things. So our, our, our base chemistry enables us to use chlorine in new and different ways, and chlorine is our most powerful biocide. Amazing. Uh, great to see you again, Ted. Thank you for coming and for your time. And Andy, did you want to quickly tell everyone a little bit about yourself and Blue Ledge Capital? I would love to. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Andy Roach. I'm the uh, founder and CIO of Blue Ledge Capital. We are a non-traditional venture capital firm with a focus on investing in physical technologies with massive impact potential. Uh, that's intentionally somewhat vague as we're quite agnostic in terms of what we, uh, what we like to look at. Um, and um, in terms of our focus, you know, our, our goal really is to make um, very few, very high conviction investments and support those companies across the capital spectrum. And so participating not just in, say, Series C or Series A, but also in Series B and beyond and really be uh, a partner for life, um, assuming everything continues to go great. Fingers crossed. Uh, thank you again, Andy, for coming. And I just want to quickly note that we'll be having a Q&A uh, from the audience. So as you're listening, please uh, start thinking of some questions. Uh, my first question is to you, Ted. Some people say that finding the right investor is like a good marriage. I'll let you be the, uh, the judge of that statement. But before we get there, could you just quickly share your story and explain why grants were an important first step before finding the right partner? Sure. Between, between starting to negotiating our participation in uh, IndieBio New York, and demo day, we got about, we got three phase ones and a phase two, and between the angels and Indie Bio, we raised about a half a million dollars. So we had about $2 million at the end of, of demo day, and then I get a call from this guy named Andy, who's a fast talker, excitable guy, who says he wants to take this big, it's really exciting, we're in the middle of a pandemic, you're gonna do something about it, so we wanna you know, push forward. And I thought, we're not really ready. We're not going to be able to, to keep the value creation going. We have to do some of our own research first. So I basically, using the marriage analogy, I was single. <laughs> Marrying money is like a full-time job. So I thought, tell you what, I didn't say let's be friends. What I said was, how about we do like a long-distance, low-key courtship? I love that. It's great. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, and I can, you can say that you are quite a prodigious uh, applicant of grants. You're the king of grants, in my opinion. Um, now, Andy, you're, you've been long involved in deep tech. What first brought you here? And uh, you know, how did you first kind of like come across Halomine and Indie Bio? Great question, great question. Um, so I, uh, yeah, I was a bit of fan of, of, of Indie Bio and by extension SOSV for, for some time. And so I'm, I'm proud to report that I actually came across Halomine at, uh, at an Indie Bio demo day. And, um, and again, you know, our, our focus is on finding technologies with this kind of outsized impact potential. And um, you know, tuning into the, the demo day at the time, I uh, you know, saw Ted speak and was blown away. And um, yeah, one thing led to another. And, and uh, you know, happily married, and uh, things, are, things are going great. No bickering. OK, good. Um, so Ted, after many months of back and forth and, and you know, in even years, you guys finally decided to work together officially. Uh, in your opinion, what catalyzed the investment proposal? So it, it really was almost 18 months before we started talking seriously. So we had, we had done our raise. We ended up getting some money from a strategic partnership. Um, as soon as we got that money, we decided we need to do everything we can to make this company successful, assuming that that partnership fails. So we started a couple of new initiatives. Those started to have a significant fruition. We thought now is the time that we need to bring in some more money to give us the flexibility to, to extend upon them. And, and I've been talking to Andy for a while. We had lunch. Um, we kept updated. I sent a newsletter. Um, what I found is that he's not just a character, but he's a man of character, which is really important. So I was comfortable talking to him and said, let's, let's raise some money. 
I would just add to that too. I, I, I think that in the process of raising capital, you frequently get pitched on you know, a deal that's closing in six or eight or 12 weeks. And it's, it's a very compressed schedule to, to do what needs to be done. Um, so I, I just have to say that it was actually great to be connected with Ted and Halamine over the span of 18 months, really get to know them. Um, and you know, when we finally did choose to kind of make that step into you know, talking deal terms, um, it, it didn't uh, kind, of, kind of flowed naturally. So it worked, worked well. Awesome, I love the story. Uh, specifically, Andy, what got you excited about the opportunity that you saw in Halo Mine, and how did you convince your venture partners to get on board? So, so I, kind of, I think I hooked you, so I, I never send out samples. So when people come and say, send me a sample and we'll, we'll look at it, I never do that. It's always a disaster. If you, want to, if you want to see how it works, you come here, you make sure it works into our lab, make sure it works, and then you can go out, or we're gonna send somebody there. So the first person I really sent anything to was Andy, who spread it all over his kitchen and then was supposed well, to report back to me about how well, because you can, you can detect chlorine on the surface with a little swab. And so I took the risk to send it to him, having no idea how much of a scientist he was or what would happen. And so I think that hooked you. It, it did. It was actually a phenomenal segue. So uh, I'll also quote Ted. He's got a, uh, what he calls a three-year-old lick test, which uh, up to this point, I, I, I'm an armchair scientist. I didn't know much about you know, cleaning products. I, like everyone, I cook raw chicken and I wipe down the counter. Um, and as I started to dig into it and realized that you know, these quaternary ammonium compounds are actually quite, uh, quite noxious, and when I ran this, this experiment with, with Ted's sample, um, you know, I did side-by-sides of, of... Did you lick it? Uh, I did not. I did not. But, uh, I, I licked it. I, I licked it. So. I, I, I probably de facto did. So what I did is I also had some quaternary ammonium test strips, which are very common to bioside in 409, um, it's a cleaning product, and, and, and really everything at the gym. It's, it's all quaternary ammonium compounds. And um, as, as I did this experiment, A, I confirmed that you legitimately can detect chlorine several days to weeks afterwards under the right conditions, uh, which is extraordinary. Chlorine is you know, highly volatile and typically leaves within you know, minutes to hours. Um, and what I also noticed, which was absolutely appalling, was that these quaternary ammonium compounds that I was putting on side by side were getting on my hands, on my face. You could detect this stuff everywhere. Um, and, and, and so Ted's got this three-year-old uh, lick test, which is basically, you know, we have all these products in our house, but would you want a three-year-old to be around that, and kids put everything in their mouth. I have to have a three-year-old nephew. Um, kids, a, kids, a little demon, but you know, it's 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 scary to think that this kid's gonna go, you know, lick a counter and, and expose himself to some pretty nasty stuff. So it's uh, yeah, the combination of those two really, uh, really, really hooked me. Wow, you guys are much braver than I am. Um, <laughs> so uh, that segues nicely to my next question uh, to you, Ted. There aren't really many similar companies out there to yours, uh, just like Veda and Biotechnics. It's such a new solution. It's hard to kind of like point to comparables to success stories, especially for biotech in those markets. How did you manage to convey your, your, you know, your opportunity in a convincing way? Well, we, we could have developed a novel coronavirus and unleashed it on the world to show people the importance of infection control, but we didn't. Uh, but it was a great marketing gig, and a lot of people started to pay attention. Um, the, first, the first venture capitalist I talked to said, I get hundreds of people that have biocides that want to do something. We're not interested. And I thought, OK, let me take that at face value and decide venture capitalists aren't the only ones with money. So. I manage as if we're in a marathon, and I hope we're in a sprint. Um, and so we had to find alternative methods. And I do have experience with grants. I leaned on grants a lot. Also looked to other people to sell the, sell the story. Um, and so the first rule, I, I really love the, the cardinal rule is survive. As long as you can survive and keep making progress and keep talking to people about it, something will go your way. An inferno to you, Andy, you know, coming from the other side of the table, what do you want to see in founders to make their kind of solution tangible and compelling? So it's a, it's a great question. I think there's kind of a few ways to take this. So I think in the beginning, you're kind of more interested in kind of hearing a narrative, hearing a story that makes sense, understanding that this addresses a large need, that there's a huge market. Um, certainly for many of, you know, my investors behind me, that's kind of where, where they stay. Um, but as time goes on, you, you need to dig in. You really need to understand that this is, you know, a platform technology. This has the potential to, you know, really transform things, and that there's 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 real science behind it. Um, and so I think there, there's, uh, and, you know, in, in working with Ted over the span of 18 months, it was, it was really great to go through that cycle to kind of start off with all my absolutely idiotic juvenile questions about like, is quaternary ammonium compound and quat the same thing, and and you name it. Um, but kind of go through that process and get to kind of that later stage when you can actually ask meaningful questions and and. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, yeah, and, and get to that point where you really feel like you understand what you're looking at and, and, and understand what you're getting involved with. So. Okay, well, um, clearly you made Halo Mine a very compelling bet. 
Ted, uh, you raised last year. Could you just tell us a little bit about that process and what you have planned next for Halo Mine? All right, so we had a great 2022. Uh, we raised $4 million in grant funding and $3 million in dilutive funding. So, so far this year, we've raised another million in grants, and I hope to close out the year with one more. Um, at some point, though, we're, we're running out of our ability to fund the company through grants, um, so we will be looking for uh, larger investment. Uh, we have a good runway right now, so I'm hoping to raise five to 10 million in about 18 months. Um, we're waiting for the technology to evolve in some of the other uh, application areas and looking for some strategic partners there as well as another way to validate uh, the work that we've done. Incredible. Well, I'm looking forward to the year ahead for Hellmine. Um, we have a few minutes for questions. Does anybody have any questions? If so, just throw up your hand. I don't know if we have a microphone. Uh, yes, you, sir? So we started out with uh, uh, a Cornell patent. So the, the Halo is a spin out from Cornell. So we had a Cornell patent. Um, the, uh, we had a, a Freedom to Operate report that said that we were infringing on an Auburn patent. And the guys that I, who were the original founders said, we just won't tell them. It'll be OK. And I said, nope, that's not, that's not how we're going to do this. Um, so we also have a, had an Auburn patent. Um, since then, we have uh, one utility filed, another um, provisional, and two disclosures. So we're paying a lot of attention to that um, and making sure that we have everything covered. Yeah, I'll just say from the investor perspective, um, your patents are, 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 are both an amazing thing, but they're also the, the bane of my existence since it's, it's very difficult to understand a patent and really know what, what, that, what rights and, and, and freedoms operate that, that bestows upon the company. Um, but I know when we, when we began diligence, um, you know, Ted was obviously very organized. He also had a comfort letter from, from his legal representation, um, which just kind of made the process much smoother to really get comfortable that this is patented, this is protected, this isn't something that can be ripped off. And it was clearly quite unique and quite novel, and that really just kind of helped, you know, from an investor perspective, build the, uh, build the necessary confidence. Awesome. Uh, thank you for the question. Any other questions? Yeah. In the back there. Uh, Ted and Andy, can you tell us a little bit more about the fundraising process? I mean, Andy, you, it seems that you run a, a kind of a, a SPV type fund, right? Correct. Where you have to raise the money on the back end of each deal that you do. How did that, that play out in your dynamic? And Ted, were you involved? side by side in the fundraising process with Andy, with his limited partners. Yes, yeah, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll kick that off because this is a funny, funny nuance to Blue Ledge Capital. Uh, most of my peers have funds, which, which makes the, the actual investment part pretty, pretty seamless. Um, I get the joy of going out and having the exact same call 100 different times with 100 different investors, um, which then have their own kind of critiques and perspectives. Um, as much as it's a bane of my existence sometimes, it's, it's actually very creative because it does uh, I hate this term, but I call it kind of decentralized VC because I get a lot of questions and, and things like that from my network that you wouldn't ordinarily get from a typical VC firm. Um, it's almost like I have 100 GPs behind me that, that kind of participate. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, you know, it's, it's, you know, a lot of investors want to keep it really simple. They want to hear a narrative. They want to hear a story about how there's a need and this fits that need. And they do not want to learn about the electronegativity of chlorine or oxidation potential or how chlorine works in water or any of that. Uh, literally, they hate it. Um, so it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of like threading that needle, and I think that you know, certainly to, to founders here raising capital, it's, it's, it's really reading your, reading your audience and understanding some folks want to dig in, some folks want to dig in quicker than others, um, but uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a wild ride. But yeah, and then uh, certainly Ted was alongside that and uh, an instrumental. So actually, I didn't, I didn't participate in a lot of that, but I, I thought my job was to supply, uh, essentially you need to be, tell a good story to be a CEO. It's one of the three things you need to do. And so I put together a lot of different ways to tell the story, and I, needed, and I supplied them all to Andy. He picked out the ones that worked best for him to tell that story to his group. Um, and that's, you know, basically, I, I was feeding him how to explain this, gave him lots of slides, lots of help, but uh, he did all the talk. And then, of, of course, satisfy my, uh, my 11th hour questions from, uh, from, from investors, so I appreciate it. Okay, I think we have time for just one more quick question. Yes, you in the back there, I think. We need to get a microphone back. So since you refer to chlorine as you know, the ultimate biocide, is there any parallel to antibiotic resistance? In other words, are there going to be organisms Great question. that they'll be, they'll be developing? And if so, what are you going to do about that? that That's why we're, we don't have a new biocide, and I say that very early. Chlorine has been used for 100 years. There's no, his, no history of resistance generation. 
So chlorine is a, stands out better than quats, which have been shown. Uh, there's some resistance being generated as we go. Uh, other approaches have also shown some of that ability. That is one of the first things people ask about. But chlorine is in low levels in all of our drinking water from the EPA. It's in every pool you can see. So it's out there. And if something was going to come from low level in, in you know, relationship with chlorine, we would have seen something that's already resistant. Chlorine is the, the, when the pandemic first started, the CDC and the WHO said one to 10 dilution of bleach, put it on all your surfaces because they knew that would kill it. Um, so there are some problems with that because it, chlorine can be corrosive. So we're trying to solve that problem. Um, but, uh, but it is the go-to uh, biocide right now because for those very reasons. It is very effective at killing and there's no history of resistance generation. Wow, that is way above my head. I don't know. I don't know how it works. We don't even know exactly how our chemical that stabilizes chlorine gets to kill the the organism. We just know that it does. Well, I, I, I want to add two things there. So I'll take a rough crack and say, you know, uh, chlorine belongs to this kind of class of, of biocides as, as an oxidizer, and so it's essentially ripping electrons from uh, from its prey, if you will. And you do that enough, you'll you'll deactivate a pathogen. Um, but the, the interesting thing I want to add is that you know chlorine is really the backbone of modern society. From the from the water we drink, the pools we swim in, um, you, you name it. Uh, but it has one one fundamental weakness, and that is that chlorine is highly volatile and evaporates uh, very quickly under normal conditions. And, and and what chlorine really brings to the table is that it stabilizes chlorine for 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 extended periods, which which is incredible. Um, so I'll, I'll I'll give one of Ted's quick pitches, which is where would you. I'm literally just stealing this from you, but yeah. would you wear sunscreen if it lasted five minutes, or would you wear deodorant if it lasted five minutes? No, that defeats the whole point of those, of those products. Um, and yet we frequently wipe down our counters with products that last mere minutes, um, and then you're subject to reinfection and transmission, and that's where, uh, that's where this guy comes in. And um, it's, it's incredible stuff, so. It's very satisfying to watch people say your words and, <laughs> and claim them as their own. It's great, it's my, it's my whole business model. It's literally, it's what I do. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've trained you well, young one. <laughs> okay, well, um, unfortunately, we are out of time. Uh, thank you for uh, your time today, Andy and Ted. Thank you. And thank you for your great questions. Uh, you'll be glad to hear we are breaking for lunch. Um, so I believe we'll have someone up on stage to give instructions for the rest of the day. Um, thank you again. Enjoy the show. Thanks, everyone.